Coming up on show 604, Tesla's Model 3 on the test track in China. Bosch moving into EV chips and why China will be key to Volkswagen's EV push. Those stories and many more coming up on today's podcast. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, however you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, your edition for Tuesday, 8th of October. My name is Martin Lee, going through every EV story I can find to save you time in one 15-minute podcast. Well, thank you to the gang at myev.com. That is the world's first marketplace, which has been designed from the ground up all about buying and selling and simplifying the buying and selling process of used EVs in the USA, connecting people in a safe and secure way as well. Why wouldn't you check out myev.com? Hey, I'm back on schedule. This has been a rarity. I have been so crazy busy recently that my schedule's been all over the place. Last year, up until the early part of this year, I was regular as clockwork. This podcast published at uh, 1 a.m. UK time, 2 a.m. European time, which, if you knock that back, is about 7 p.m., 8 p.m. Eastern time, depending on clock changes. And then it's been a very busy year so far. So apologies for my schedule being out of whack. Hopefully the start, hopefully, of getting into the old routine. And I must admit, I do like it. So here is the news for Tuesday. Well, let's talk, uh, first of all, about the Tesla Model 3 in China and going round a test track at Gigafactory 3. So, a few months ago, there wasn't a factory. Now there is a factory, and there's even a test track at it. This, this story continues to blow my mind. But, you know, I talked about how they've built a supercharger station at Gigafactory 3, how it's it's looking basically ready to go. There's groundworks. They're just they're planting... They're planting a few uh, a few nice bits of greenery around, you know, tart the place up a little bit before the grand opening in a couple of days' time. However, there also appears to be a test track that they've had time, maybe at the weekend, you know, had some time off, built ourselves a test track at Gigafactory 3, and there has been a Black Model 3 sighted by drones driving around the test track. User Vincent on Twitter says, maybe the very first Made in China Model 3 trial production version caught at the Gigafactory 3, right next to a white container. Well, of course, the very first word in that tweet is maybe, and there is no way of knowing that the Model 3 that's been going around the test track was indeed made in China. So we are starting from pretty shaky ground if you want to say that this story is all about them testing a car that's made in China. But it wouldn't be a big stretch of the imagination to say the car, the black car that's been driving around the test track, could well have been made in a trial run of the Model 3 at Gigafactory 3. So how many cars do you reckon they'll make between now and the end of the year? And some people saying, actually, it could be a very reasonable number, and actually China's Gigafactory 3 could be the thing that gives Tesla an amazing, another record-breaking quarter for over 100,000 cars delivered thanks to China's Gigafactory 3. October 13th, incidentally, Kind of a digression, but this this is applicable to this story. Chi- uh, Chinese Model 3 purchasers have been told that October 13th will be the last time that you can order one that will have been made in the US. If you order one from October 14th onwards, your Model 3, at least standard range plus. And, uh, you know, this story is so quickly evolving. I always thought standard range plus made in China and then... Long-range performance going to be made still in Fremont, where the the more the, you know the high-power motors are being used to get that extra power. Uh, but you know, so much has changed. It could well be they're making all of the Chinese Model Threes in Gigafactory Three. I continue to research this for you. Gigafactory Three, very important, say Tesla Rati for Tesla. As it is for China's electric car market, China is pursuing an aggressive goal for adopting EV transportation. And having a pioneer like Tesla operating a locally owned facility will increase the EV adoption rate amongst local car buyers. And of course, once the Model 3 has had a good sales run in China, then it will be time for Model Y. But okay, let's not run before we can walk. Let's stay with the Model 3. Starting mid-October, production of Model 3, Gigafactory 3 at uh, Shanghai. Exciting times for Tesla. And actually, exciting times 
for those who like to customise their cars. Tesla Arty tweeted out about how Tesla owners will be able to honk their horn, except it won't be a horn. You can honk with fart and goat sounds. Well, Elon saw Tesla Arty's article and retweeted it and said, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And then retweeted a quite a, a famous YouTube Taylor Swift goat meme video uh, in a tweet that was on Sunday. Elon announced that customized horn and movement sounds, coconuts being one, of course, uh, from Monty Python, would be coming to Tesla's soon. And then he put a blast of wind emoji indicating wind, fart, uh, and a goat as well. And who knows, that is just the tip of the iceberg. There is a thing that we need to remember about Teslas, apart from the breakneck speed and groundbreaking engineering that's behind the car. Elon just wants their cars to put a smile on your face. He wants to make products that are fun. Hence why you can now do this. Not the first time that Teslas have been able to generate farting sounds, says the website The Week. As an Easter egg feature released last December, uh, you could toggle fart mode via the screen and the internal speakers would then let rip. This new proposal replaces the horn sound with a customizable one and the movement sound as well. As you know, new legislation in place where there's a little speaker uh, which means that all EVs actually have to make a sound at low speed to warn people that uh, maybe those are visually impaired or people staring at their smartphones and uh, the, the, an EV. I, I only hesitate because I've seen some some quite mean slash tongue-in-cheek funny comments online saying, look, if someone's on their smartphone and they're one of these people that stare at their phone, they walk into walls and lampposts, if they walk in, fr in front of the car... That's natural selection at work, my friends. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. It's a little bit mean. We should make cars safe. And so all the car makers have scratched their heads and gone, oh, what can we do? Some sort of like sound as they move forward. I, I, on my Renault Zoe, I turn it off. I can't stand the noise. But anyway, because if, if I'm on a road with no pedestrians around, why do I need this thing on at uh, 10 miles an hour? However, Tesla have gone, ah, interesting problem. The car has to make a noise at low speed, you say. Okay, where are the coconuts from Monty Python? We'll make it play that. It certainly puts a smile on your face. I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to find out more. Let's move on to Bosch, and they're going to produce range-boosting microchips for electric vehicles. Production begins in Germany next year of a new generation of energy-efficient microchips specifically for use in EVs. With the first samples of the 150 millimeter wafer plant uh, will then be delivered to potential customers and finding their way into series production of EVs within the next three years. The chips will use different semiconducting material called silicon carbide, designed to withstand the high temperatures and voltages found in power electronics, a court, uh, reports Automotive News Europe today. Now, while more complex to produce, these chips lower the improved con uh, conductivity, of 50% less energy lost in the form of heat. And for drivers, they say, that will translate real world into an average of 6% more range. And who doesn't love a little bit more range? Like that story we were telling you about recently of Tesla's new patent application of changing the way that the heated and the cooling seats work because they everything they could get off the shelf well, isn't great, so they've invented their own. And they're not in the cars yet, don't get me wrong, it's just a pattern application, but again, more efficient. 1%, 2% more efficient. These are all small gains, but you add them all up together and all of a sudden, 10, 20, 30 miles, when you can combine lots of things together, you either get more range or it allows you to put in a, a smaller battery for the same range, as it were. I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to read more. Let's go to Bloomberg next, who are talking about one of the implications of the move to electric vehicles, Volvo. And Geely, of course, their parent company, are going to merge their engine units in their EV push. Well, today, Volvo and Geely's plans emerged for their engine operations to merge into a standalone company, except the Swedish automaker says is going to cut costs as it moves to a full EV lineup. According to Bloomberg, the combined unit would supply 2 million diesel and gas engines compared with the 600,000 that Volvo themselves make today. The two companies can then achieve scale and reduce material costs and could well supply 
other automakers as well. But they're having to do this because they are making a very quick leap, as much as they can, into electric vehicles whilst maintaining their piston business, which makes them some money. That's going to fund the shift to EVs. And they're doing it as quick as possible. They said that no jobs will be eliminated in forming this new supplier. 3,000 Volvo workers, 5,000 Geely workers, engineering, procurement, manufacturing, uh, IT, finance, uh, they're all involved as well. And we know that Volvo have said they want to go all electric, the first of those. A, fir- a fully, this is not Polestar, by the way, Polestar 2 is a separate thing, it's their spin off brand. The Volvo XC40, it's a compact crossover, that'll be their first fully V coming soon and the first of many. And so they're trying to negotiate. All of the OEMs have to have this real... They're doing this dance of trying not to go out of business because they've all built business plans based on piston cars. And then over the last couple of years, how they didn't see it coming, I don't know, you and I did, this electrification rush that is happening so much faster than the naysayers want and the doubters think can happen is forcing all of these innovative new ideas and solutions for OEMs. Well, moving to Electrive next, and Audi just officially confirmed the production of their Audi Q4 e-tron, and that's going to roll off the production line at Zwickau. Now, Zwickau is a Volkswagen plant, of course, Volkswagen own Audi, and that's where a lot of the electric production is going to take place with the VW brand, the group, not just the brand, cars. A sportier version of the Q4 and a saloon as well, and they're all built on the MEB platform. That's the platform that's making the, the ID3, the, 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 the don't call it a golf car it's, it looks like a golf and it's about the same size as a as a golf and it's aimed at golf buyers but it's not a golf it's the ID3 and it's the Audi Q4 e-tron uh, they still call it the concept at this stage is going to be built on the MEB platform of course Audi's working with a few different platforms they've got that from their parent company uh, VW but then they've also got their plugins which use a different at the minute a different platform then there's going to be the Audi e-tron GT the e-tron GT is their equivalent of their cousin company Porsche's Porsche Taycan, and that uses that platform. So it's it's a few different uh, balls in the air and plates spinning for Audi. All right, let's move on. And an auto car analysis article today talks about China. And often, you know, I'm kind of obsessed with the car market in China, and I feel like I read about this all the time, and I, I've scratched like one percent of the surface on this and we really must get more guests on from the chinese uh, car industry autocar says the rapid expansion of vw's id range will ramp up next year with two suv based models but they're going to be based and offered only in china china will play a key role in vw's goal to sell a million id cars by 2023 uh, stefan wollenstein vw's china boss said the country is the driving force behind vw and the ID3, when it was launched at the Frankfurt Motor Show, very much for the Chinese market as well. About half of VW's 6.2 million car sales were in China last year. The Chinese government incentives really heavily pushing EVs at the moment. VW has their, their, their sights set on making 22 million electric cars by 2028. But half of those, again, are for the Chinese markets. Really interesting article from Autocar. Goes into other makers... The joint ventures that have had to be done like FAW VW and SAIC VW because uh, VW at the time and well Tesla were the first ones that have been allowed to do that. But you had to form a joint venture with a domestic company in China until until recently. And that was to bring in knowledge into the, 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 the Chinese car market. And so I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to read more about how China, the, the, the push towards EVs likened to a gold rush, actually but some very serious domestic competition there. Well, moving on to why plug-in hybrids could well be a compliance lifeline. The rules change next year here in Europe, and it's all about CO2 grams per kilometre. And if you can get your cars below 50 grams per kilometre, then there are some real incentives to do that, because if you still want to sell your big, stinky, profitable, very profitable SUVs that have got very high emissions figures, if you can then sell... Another car that's low emission, it cancels it out with the new regulations coming in. And Actually, uh, you can sell one EV, but two stinky SUVs because there's a, 
uh, a slight weighting as well at the beginning of all this. Because of the way emissions are calculated, plug-in hybrids are easily capable of recording a very low CO2 figure, and that's just due to the, the way the test is done. So they're focusing a lot on plug-in hybrids as well. Of course, a, a 10, 15, 20 kilowatt hour battery in a hybrid means you can make three or four hybrids per one, what, the battery that you would have to put in a pure electric vehicle. So for many people, plug-in hybrids make sense as buyers, and for the automakers themselves, there is still a real push on plug-in hybrids for many reasons as well. But will all of that get superseded by brilliant pure electric vehicles? Have a read of the article that I'm going to pop from Automotive News Europe in the show notes. On to motorsport next. You know I love motorsport. I love my autosport subscription, uh, which gives me access to some great articles on autosport. And Formula One's stakeholders, they say, have been debating the direction of the next generation rules. At the minute, Formula One is hybrid. Of course, they're up against Formula E, which is the up-and-coming all-electric series. But the pace of the world is changing, says the boss of Renault, Cyril Abitable. And in my opinion, there is a huge risk that F1 is going to get left behind. Look at Greta Thunberg. Look at electrification. Things that people are saying today would never have been considered six months ago. Even Ferrari now talking about all-electric cars. And so even Formula One, the pinnacle of motorsport, many would say, is now looking around and even naming people like Greta Thunberg and saying hang on a minute, we can't carry on doing it the way we have done it. What does the buying public want to see? Now, my opinion on this, if I may offer my opinion, my opinion on this is slightly different to many people. And I think if we can electrify Monday to Friday, there's no problem burning some things on Saturday and Sunday. No one is saying that in the next five to ten years, we have to become completely zero emission. That's that's the dream, right? That would be ideal, But what would be wrong with making sure that we all drive electric cars, ride on electric buses, have our deliveries done by electric trucks? But at the weekend, I don't know if you want, if you have a car in the garage, if a classic car in the garage, you want to take it out on a Sunday with you and your partner, have the the roof down and enjoy a 50 year old car. You want to convert it to EV power. Some people do. What would be wrong with that? I think it would, you know. It's kind of a balancing act. And I know that ideologically, I'm not speaking everyone's language now. It's kind of where I see it. And I don't don't mind a little bit of racing if it means burning a little bit of fuel, because at some point we won't be able to do that anymore. You know, we simply won't be able to do that. So I don't know. What do you think? Maybe a few people listening might disagree with me on, on that one. Hey, we're all friends here. Don't be mean. Finally, California's clean truck rule is going to lead nicely into our question of the week this week. California officials are gearing up to launch a momentous new rule to tackle one of the largest sources of pollution in the state, medium and heavy duty commercial trucks. After years of deliberation and public input, the rule is the first of its kind and long overdue, says Clean Technica today by the writer NRDC. Don't know who that is, but thank you very much for writing this article on Clean Technica. Uh, Traditional diesel burning trucks, medium duty, heavy duty trucks like the Ford F-250s up to 18 wheelers are a source of smog forming pollutants and carcinogenic uh, particulates and climate forcing greenhouse gases. And now California's legislators and regulators have said through an advanced clean truck rule that the California Air Resources Board, CARB, that they will be required... Truck manufacturers will be required to sell a zero emission truck and it must be on sale from 2024 through to 2030. Uh, The rule requires fleet owners with more than 100 trucks to report information about their operation. The data will then inform future policy and ensure that fleets are only buying zero emission trucks going forward. And I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to read more. So question of the week this week is very much tied to that last story. No coincidence I put that story last because I'm asking you what segment of vehicles is most important to electrify? Is it trucks? Is it buses? Is it trains? Is it planes? What segment of vehicles is most important to electrify first? Is it the cars we all drive? Let me know. Email me hello at evnewsdaily.com or leave a comment in the show notes or on my website evnewsdaily.com or go to the socials and I'll see your comments there. Thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon. Uh, That is you, Phil Roberts of Electric Future. You, Brad Crosby, and you, Avid Technology, my premium partners, and 254 people who do keep me going. Check out patreon.com slash evnewsdaily to add your name to the list. There are 603 previous shows online. The archive is online for free. 
As long as I can afford to do it, I'll put all those 600 odd shows online for anybody that wants to dip into them at any time. The new shows come at you first and free and automatically if you're a subscriber and it's a free subscription. Say hi on social media by searching for the phrase EV News Daily. You'll find me. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>